Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and thank you everybody for coming uh, early in the morning uh, in Indonesia. Um, it is uh, early evening here in San Diego and one of the benefits, I should say, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was being uh, normalizing these types of uh, long range uh, conference appearances. Um, otherwise, it would have taken me uh, many hours and many flights uh, to be with you today. But here I can just uh, hop on and uh, and share some of the work that my students have been doing. So I'm meeting many of you for the first time, and what I thought I would do is just show you briefly what my group works on uh, overall. So we work in this area of the mechanical properties of electronic polymers, and we study this uh, this type of um, this type of material, electronic polymers, all the way from the size scale of molecular structure to conformation and solution in the solid state, as well as bulk morphology and structure and defects. We apply this work to flexible and robust thin film photovoltaic cells, mechanical biosensors, and then the newest area, which I'm going to talk about today, is haptic biomaterials. So haptics refers to the intersection of technology with the sense of touch and what we are trying to do is use material science to both understand the sense of touch and also manipulate it in technological contexts. Now human culture is replete with artifacts that interact with the senses to add beauty to the world and in the visual sense you have painting sculpture film and other types of visual art for the auditory and gustatory that is hearing and taste senses you have music poetry or I'm sorry, you have for the auditory sense, you have music, poetry, then for the gustatory and olfactory sense, that's taste and smell, you have food, beer, wine, cosmetics, perfume. But for touch, I would argue that there is a question mark. Now, it's true that massage is a type of cultural artifact, but it's not a material artifact in the same way that a painting or a musical instrument is. So our group believes that there is a tremendous opportunity here to combine materials chemistry with touch for applications in medical training, remote care, and even the tactile arts. And the uh, analogy that runs through this uh, our um, work in this area is called the RGB of vision. So that is the red, green, and blue of vision. Now in the screen that you're looking at right now, you have color filters that are combining at various intensities to produce these wide range of images on the screen. And you can create almost any shape or color on a screen. Your skin has a number of different mechanoreceptors, just as your eye has a, has a number of different color receptors that respond to things like stretch, vibration, pressure, uh, fine touch, and so forth. And, uh, and what's happening deep down here is that once the nerve ending is perturbed, it generates an action potential which travels up to the uh, up to the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal cord and then up to the brain. Now imagine a concept where you have many different virtual, in this case round objects in a bin and your job is to find the tennis ball if you have to compare it to a golf ball, a basketball, or a hot stone. And the hypothesis is that there exists a minimum number of tactile actuators like red, green, and blue that can recapitulate or mimic all of these sensations that give rise to these 
objects. Now this figure down here was taken from a physiology textbook, but in 2010, the, uh, the ion channel that was discovered that mediates this uh, transduction of mechanical force was discovered by Ardem Pataputian's lab. Uh, and uh, Ardem Pataputian last year won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And we actually have a, uh, a grant um, with, with him and we just hired a joint uh, postdoc to build microfluidic devices to understand the deformation of these channels using the tools of material science. Now haptics have been around for a long time and we, we sort of rely on haptics or future technologies will rely on haptics to deliver all kinds of, uh, of, of sensations that we hope will be realistic. And in general, hard materials, hard objects are used to recapitulate these sensations. So this is an asymmetric uh, rotary motor called a vibrotactile device. These are some pneumatic kind of pulley actuators that simulate robotic surgery. And it's important to notice or to note that haptics, ref that we use the word haptics in two senses. The first is the sense of fine touch, texture, temperature, thermal conductivity. And the second is the kinesthetic sense, the sense of motion, the solidness of objects. And what our hypothesis is, is that the near surface properties of objects everywhere around you in the natural and even the abiotic environment is mediated by organic matter and nanoscale phenomena. So even a piece of clean glass or metal that is nominally inorganic is going to be covered with organic media from the atmosphere in order to lower the surface energy of the object. So we think that if we are trying to recapitulate the properties of any material, then we need to be able to manipulate matter on the small scale. So we're not the first people to be interested in the connection between materials and haptics. This is a nice review article that was published by um, Biswas and Vissel at uh, UC Santa Barbara um, on emerging material technologies for haptics. Mostly these used a mechanical paradigm. So how do you get materials to press into the skin? Uh, and this is some work by Tina Ng in, uh, in my own uh, electrical engineering department at UC San Diego and, uh, and her student, uh, Yi Chen Jai, who, uh, who wrote this article. I was nice, uh, they were nice enough to ask for a contribution from, from me, but this is on uh, printing materials for haptic actuators. Our focus tends to be, however, more in the, the molecular and nanoscale. So there's been a lot of nice work on haptic devices. This is some work from Ed Colgate's group on surface haptics, which uses electroadhesion and electrovibration phenomena to mimic sensations that occur on a two-dimensional screen using the types of types of materials and devices that you can already integrate into existing types of uh, tablet computers, for example. This is some work by my colleague Tanya Morimoto on soft actuators for applications in telehealth and robotic surgery. So a lot of great work uh, going on there. The first question that we wanted to ask as we were interested in the connection between material science and touch is can we distinguish hydrophilic and hydrophobic surfaces by touch? So we took a an oxidized silicon wafer and a fluoroalkyl silanized silicon wafer and we had participants uh, touch these slabs of silicon that were modified in this way and we found that the participants were very good at differentiating which ones were the hydrophilic substrates and which ones were the hydrophobic substrates. Now this was when they were allowed free exploration, so scanning their finger across the surface. And then we also did an experiment where the participants were only allowed to tap and not scan. And that was to test if, if the adhesion alone was enough to differentiate the surface. And it turns out that it was. 
If you plot the proportion correct versus the skin moisture, we find that the, the participants with sweatier skin tended to perform more poorly on this uh, particular task. This work was done by Cody Carpenter, who's now in, uh, who, who's now at Eli Lilly, a, a pharmaceutical company. Charles Dong is a professor of material science at University of Delaware. Nick Root was a graduate student with V.S. Ramachandran, our cognitive science uh, collaborator. And Nick is now still working with us, but now as a member of, uh, of Ramka Rao's group in psychology at University of Amsterdam. You can do some kind of cute things with this uh, with this type of device. So if you can pattern little patches of oxidized and alkyl silanized surfaces, then you can spell words in uh, in the the um, uh, alphabet using patches of hydrophilic and hydrophobic words encoded using the ASCII alphabet. Uh, and subjects were pretty good at doing this. So, uh, so five subjects were able to get the correct word um, all, uh, uh, all at, uh, at once. Now, this is not a, um, without any errors, I should say. Now, this is not a fast process. It's very difficult to, to do this task. So humans decode information at, at, uh, at 100 millibits per second, whereas a good internet connection might be uh, might be 100 megabits per second. So we call this uh, we call this this uh, molecular braille, uh, which is a, tec a technique that you use to communicate or that blind individuals use to uh, use to read letters. But this is no substitute really for braille. It's just kind of a, a uh, an analogy. Now, why? How does this work? How can our participants accomplish this task? Well, there was a paper uh, several years ago with these buckled surfaces that had that had amplitudes down to 10 nanometers tall, and it was found that participants could differentiate textured from untextured surfaces simply by scanning their fingers across. And they did this not by feeling the actual 10 nanometer relief structure, but rather the vibrations that were produced in the skin as a result of dragging their fingers along. So we thought something similar might be going on here. So we took a PDMS finger with the tack removed by plasma oxidation and dragged it across a surface that had either the fluoroalkane or the hydroxyl group on the surface. And what we found, or rather you can imagine a few different ways of this experiment proceeding. Either the finger travels along the surface uh, in in a, uh, in a stick slip manner in which the force goes up, the force goes down, force goes up, force goes down, either in uh, in in um, synchrony or out of synchrony uh, between surfaces. So if you have synchronous, uh, highly correlated stick slip friction behavior, uh, like your hand rubbing on something that kind of makes a noise when you rub against it, like fingers on a chalkboard or a door creaking, I'll go, eh. but then if you rub your finger on another surface, it might be a higher frequency like, eh. uh, so what we did is we measured the force traces uh, that were that occurred here. Um, and we compared them from uh, from the hydrophobic to hydrophilic surfaces. Now at this combination, a velocity of 2.5 millimeters per second and downward force zero grams, we got very weak correlation between the oxidized and the silanized surface. If you change the velocity and the mass, you can get very similar uh, correlation. So this, uh, or very high correlation. So you can see this third trace actually overlaps exactly, even though the surface energy is quite different between the two surfaces. And these results also agree with an analytical model of friction from the literature. Now it's possible to plot these data with the velocity versus the mass in a way that makes it easy to visualize. So as you combine 
the velocity and the mass, you get some regions that are shown in red and orange here where the traces overlap. They have very high correlation and you would expect that if you were to drag your finger across those surfaces and your finger had the mechanical surface like PDMS, or like the silicone rubber that we used, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference at that scanning speed and that downward force. Uh, but there are certain combinations of velocity and mass where those friction, friction traces are highly uncorrelated and thus it's possible to tell the difference between the two surfaces and we call these discriminability matrices. Now our fake fingers didn't have any fingerprints and of course you and I have fingerprints so if you add fingerprints to the surface it actually much more of the the matrix turns green so it's possible to use this kind of uh, this kind of uh, analysis to maybe inform uh, the design of robotic fingers that might have better tactile sensitivity than is possible uh, uh, with without. All right, so next we went on to softness. So softness is quantifiable in engineering, uh, but what about for human perception? So the hypothesis that we tested is that softness is determined by some combination of extrinsic parameters. By extrinsic, I mean, sure, this uh, washcloth is is soft, but it only becomes soft when you when you touch it, right? So, uh, so the material itself will depend on the way in which you, the properties of the material might depend on the way you interact with them. How does that, how does that work? So we looked at two different uh, intrinsic or two different extrinsic parameters, contact area, which is the area modulated um, uh, by, so contact area is the area that your fingertip makes with the surface. Uh, and indentation depth is the amount of depth that your finger penetrates into the material. Now, if you go to the hardware store and you buy a block of rubber or a sponge or something with isotropic patterning within it, your contact area and your indentation depth are going to vary in uh, in a correlated fashion, and it's difficult to decouple contact area and indentation depth, but using nano and microfabrication, we can do it to some extent. So what we did is, or what my uh, postdoc Charles Dong did, was to make uh, silicone rubber slabs that had relief structures patterned into them and then also took the same slabs and changed their thickness uh, so that the uh, by decreasing the height it was possible to constrain the lateral spread so that you could make a very a very soft slab feel hard because it couldn't be pen penetrated very de uh, very deeply from the fingertip so here are some electrical impedance tomography images that uh, that sort of show you the contact how the contact area evolves with uh, increasing downward mass. And here are some microscope images. Now I show this uh, this table not to confuse everybody, but just to show you uh, how we chose these uh, these markers in the next slide. So we had three different Young's moduli. So we made nine samples total, three different Young's moduli, uh, several different thicknesses, and then several different, or, and then three different types of uh, micro patterning that that had different uh, percentages of the surface area exposed. So a triangle, so a dark red triangle corresponds to the material with the greatest modulus and the highest thickness and 30% effective surface area. The 30% corresponds to the three vertices of a triangle. And then 50% has a star because there are five, uh, five points of the star. Notice that the modulus here was sort of, and the thickness were sort of jumbled to avoid proving the trivial result that the softest material has, uh, uh, the softest material um, has the um, uh, has the the lowest modulus. 
So we did a couple of different psychophysical methods, a two alternative force choice test and a rank choice test. Now, many of you uh, have been to the eye doctor where they offer you a two alternative force choice where they say better one, better two, better one, better three, better four, better five, better six. Uh, and then you, auto you tell the doctor, uh, this lens is, is better, this one's better, although sometimes they jumble them up and give you, give you the different numbers for the same lens in order to confuse you. I'm sure there's some psychology at work there. Uh, but what we did was we took these slabs and we offered them to the participants and we said, which is softer? Softer one, softer two, softer two, softer three. And after about, uh, after about 100 paired comparisons per, uh, per participant, we were able to plot the data. So this is the aggregate percentage judged softer of all of these different slabs. So light red, that is this light red star, was judged softest less than 25% of the time. And this dark blue circle was judged the softest about 90% of the time. So this is the softest sample. It kind of wins the, uh, the two alternative force choice test. Now there's another way of plotting these data, and that is if we keep track of the winner in every one of the force choice comparisons, then we can say, we can look at light red and dark blue and say that dark blue was judged to be softer 100% of the time. And then we look at dark blue and light red and dark blue was judged to be, uh, or light red was judged to be softer 0% uh, of the time, because we're looking at the, uh, this is a sign, this, this legend is assigned on the basis of the y-axis. Now, if you look at the x-axis here, um, if you look at the x-axis here, you'll notice that the uh, that the x-axis is the same uh, ordering from left to right. Now, this is not guaranteed to happen, and actually points to something quite we think profound. So, if you imagine classical composers like Mozart and Beethoven and say that you ask a hundred people uh, who their favorite classical composer is and uh, mostly people will say Mozart but uh, but slightly less often people will say Beethoven but in head-to-head -head comparisons maybe Beethoven beats Mozart and it could be for some uh, some culturally specific reason. What if there's a movie or something that's very famous where Beethoven was mean to Mozart or something? And in that case, what we would have is a reversal between uh, two, um, two of the entries on the x-axis here when you plot aggregate percentage versus the head-to-head -head comparisons. These uh, axes would not have the labels in the same order. Now that implies mathematical transitivity to our conception of softness. And just to show that the uh, softness was not dependent on any one of the intrinsic parameters of thickness, surface area, or modulus, or any one of the extrinsic parameters, indentation depth and contact area, you can see all this scatter here to the data. It doesn't give you a nice, uh, a nice a plot like, like this does. So something, something else is going on. It's clearly a combination. Um, so using something called the Akaike Information Criterion, which is a technique I had never heard of before we did this project or before I was collaborating with psychology people. And uh, what this does is use a, uh, use a statistical method to score different models uh, that explain the experimental data. So what we find, and the lower the AIC score, the better. So the best model was a sum of the, the contact area and the square root of the indentation depth, and that gave this dotted red curve down here, which assumed a, uh, a rigid finger. So what's interesting here is that the sensation of hardness or softness um, isn't really dependent on that first initial bit of deformation of the finger. It really only, you really only be, become sensitive to these differences after the bone in your finger becomes involved in the indentation. 
So if you uh, put your coefficients in, this is actually the equation that you as an engineer or scientist could use to dial in a certain level of softness. All right, so there were a couple of take home messages from this, uh, from this work is that the perception of softness was based on the, um, was, was not based on the XY resolution of the patterning, but rather the effect on the strain field. Okay, what does that mean? Well, our microstructures were about 40 microns apart, which is smaller than the spacing between the, uh, the Meissner corpuscles in the fingertip. So how is it possible that we can even feel those differences? Well, if you have a micro pattern surface versus a planar surface, you'll notice that the strain field that penetrates into the skin is very different between these two scenarios. And we think that the brain is actually interpreting these signals um, to mean that this surface is actually harder than this surface, even if the penetration depth is the same. These are things that I all already kind of covered, but these are the take home messages. Again, this work was done by Charles Dong. We were also very interested in the survivability of microstructures. So this is some work that was done by Mickey Finn and an undergraduate student, Jeremy Triber, where what they did is they reasoned that if you want to make these micro patterns over real surfaces like screens, keyboards, uh, car steering wheels, anything that we interact with in a tactile sense, you want to make sure that they're survivable that they survive real world forces. Now, most forces that are placed on test objects in research labs are very, very tiny forces. So we wanted to use interrogatory. So like interrogation, if you're interrogating a surface with your hands in a real world environment, which ones are going to survive and which ones aren't. So uh, we came up with a couple of findings that uh, the aspect ratio is the dominant factor through its effect on bending stiffness, the aspect ratio of, the, of uh, cylindrical micro pillars. All else equal, larger diameters are less susceptible to both breakage and collapse, and the spacing between them determines what type of adhesive failure, whether the pillars adhere to the ground or adhere to each other, uh, you get. And the higher modulus of a material actually leads to recovery. If the modulus is too high, it can abrade the workpiece or the finger. So these diagrams, we call these lipstick diagrams, uh, point to the different types of um, uh, the, the results of, of this based on three different um, aspects for two different tensile moduli that span uh, two orders of magnitude here. So where it's green, you're in good shape, and that leads to pristine uh, survival. And then uh, up one level of damage, we have pairwise uh, uh, sticking, clustering of multiple pillars, and matting of uh, multiple pillars to the ground. All right, so we're very interested in materials properties and how the properties of polymeric solids in particular can be used to manipulate the sense of touch. And we did a little bit of work in the area of kinesthesia where we took a thermoplastic uh, thermoplastic um, uh, acrylic polymer that we tuned to have a glass transition temperature that was close to the surface temperature of the skin. And we impregnated this material into a textile. And what we were able to do is instrument a glove with flex sensors and thermoelectric devices that could selectively melt or freeze the thermoplastic uh, acrylate. And then we uh, were able to control a robotic finger that could make contact with a wall. The robotic finger has a pressure sensor. It sent a signal back to the, uh, to the glove, to the thermoelectric devices in particular that would freeze the thermoplastic. And so um, this was kind of an, an interesting demonstration. Uh, the response times were not great in the tens of seconds, but it's difficult to do this, to generate this type of stopping force in a very thin form factor using uh, 
you know, conventional bulky actuators. One nice thing about using a thermoplastic for stopping force is that once you, uh, if you break the, uh, the material in its glassy state, um, you can uh, you can break it and then you can re-solidify it just by heating it above its glass transition temperature. All right, we also looked at ionotactile devices, so bridging the gap. So electronics uses electrons, biology conducts signals using ions primarily. So can you also use ionic solids to, uh, to trick the, or I'm sorry, ionic um, ionically conductive objects to uh, to trick the mechanoreceptors in the skin into generating action potentials and thus the feeling of uh, of, of uh, mechanical perturbation. So we made these thimble-like devices, and then we filled these little areas here with uh, with this ionic conductive gel. So based on a conventional polyacrylamide. What we found is that when we used water in here, uh, we lost all the mass through evaporation. But when we swapped out the water for glycerol by putting it in a big bath of, uh, of glycerol, the water became displaced and the glycerol had a high enough dielectric constant to, uh, to absorb, um, to solubilize uh, the, uh, the sodium chloride that we used to deliver the signal. So we were able to get electrotactile uh, signals using uh, relatively low voltages by the standards of electrotactile stimulation. And how to read this plot here, this uh, red one is that it's it's kind of kind of painful. This one is this black curve is they, they can just feel it. So where you want to be is right at the tips of the uh, the tips of the error bars. For the uh, for the just noticeable threshold, this work was done by Sam Root, um, who did his is on his second postdoc now. He did his first one in George Whiteside's group and his second one in Shannon Bao's group. My first language is actually organic chemistry, and we were interested in using uh, chemical synthetic methods in order to design a single component conductive elastomer based on p.pss that can be used to actuate tactile uh, um, signals. So what we did is we used a controlled radical polymerization method, which gives you very nice control over the length of a polymer chain um, of this polystyrene sulfonic acid, which was copolymerized with a, uh, with a polyethylene glycol acrylate material. And uh, then we did oxidative uh, polymerization of this uh, pol uh, ethylene dioxythiophene monomer. And what that gives you is a block copolymer where this one is negatively charged. This one has these long uh, hairs on it, like a bottle brush. So we have this charged strand and then this bottle brush strand. And the bottle brush strand gives you stretchability. The reason that it's stretchable is because you have a lot of entropy, a lot of degrees of freedom of these side chains. And if you stretch out these polymer chains, then you still have relatively high entropy because you have a lot of configurational space for these side chains to maneuver. And then this material, when it's oxidatively polymerized, leaves positive charges along the backbone. So where does that go? It bonds ionically to the uh, sulfonate group. And then you have this material, which is a conductor that's bound uh, ionically to this side chain. So this whole part is the conductive part, and this part is the stretchable part. This work was done by Laura Kayser, who's also now a professor of material science and chemistry at University of Delaware. And what we found with our, uh, our material is that the toughness of the, uh, of the material is the highest, but its conductivity is the lowest. Um, so we wanted to increase the conductivity. So uh, my current postdoc, Rachel Blau, um, increased the length of this, uh, this stretchable segment. But what we found is that this also decreased the conductivity, which we didn't want. So we added some more of this block to the mix to make it more conductive. This work was published uh, just a few, uh, a few, um, oops, 
a few months ago in 2022, we were also um, able to show that this work um, could outperform Clevios in conductivity. So Clevios is commercial P.PSS, which is right here when you plot conductivity versus strain at failure. And our material is up here, kind of in this favorable region where it's the most conductive, but it offers you more than 20% stretchability and this uh, ability to conform to the skin and also to conduct ions and electrons gives you a, a nice uh, high volumetric capacity which is good for measuring signals from the skin so this column here the second column here shows you a high signal to noise rate in these biopotential measurements this is surface electromyography of the wrist as the participant is is uh, making uh, gestures with opening and closing their hand and also making gestures with their fingers you could incorporate materials like this into multifunctional haptic gloves that could be used to both uh, to both control robotic hands in uh, in augmented environments but also could be used to um, to interact with uh, with virtual reality uh, objects and uh, what what we did here was we combined the electrotactile effect which is generated using the conductive polymer with two commercial devices a vibrotactile device and a thermoelectric device so with these three different say rgb pixels in place to go back to the original slide where we said that was the ultimate goal so what we used was the electrotactile device to simulate roughness based on the intermittency of the electrotactile signal. So it could go like would be rough and maybe would be smooth. Vibrotactile would give you a high amplitude for uh, for for soft. So it would go for soft and it would go for hard. And then for thermoelectric, you could simulate coldness by um, by um, by one polarity of the thermoelectric and hotness by reversing the polarity of the thermoelectric. And uh, this is my hand actually is controlling this robotic hand. And this is my student. And This is a heat gun here. And you'll have to take my word for it that my hand is getting hot. So this work was done by Colin Keefe, who is a, a talented master's student in the group. So these are some results in virtual reality. Uh, the experiment that we did was taking eight different mystery panels that had different levels of, of, of uh, softness, temperature, and texture. Uh, and the participants went into the, uh, the simulation and they were able to interact with these surfaces. Now, if you, uh, if you have the experimental experiments are there to tell them what they're feeling and then they, you mix up the panels and then they do it again, we, we call that training and the participants are quite good at doing that. But if you just send them in uh, blind without the experiments are interacting with them at all and answering their questions and so forth. We call that untrained. And when the, the participants go in blind, they're actually still quite good at determining the differences here. So in, uh, in conclusion, I think that materials chemistry should be a central part of research on mechanosensory perception shown you some role of surface monolayers in perception and an unexpected role for fingerprints in determination of surface energy of structures. We have new a uh, new model for parameters of softness based on integrated uh, uh, interaction area and indentation depth. We've shown you conductive elastomers based on conjugated polymers and ionic organogels acrylic thermoplastics for mimicking kinesthetic forces, integration of new materials phenomena into multifunctional haptic devices. And I think that this is really an extension of physical organic chemistry. So making small, whoops, making small changes to materials properties to affect a macroscopic observable. 
So in conclusion, I would like to thank uh, financial support from these institutions and foundations. I'd like to thank all of my group members who I didn't uh, call out specifically, and thank you very much for your attention. And I see a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm more than happy uh, to go through those one by one if that's the way uh, you would like to proceed. All right, so I think I will go through the questions in the chat. What is the most difficult sense of touch to replicate? Hydrophobicity, sweat, sticky surface, etc. Well, one of the most difficult that we're finding is the sense of moisture. And the reason it's so difficult is because it involves a few different effects. It involves uh, modulation of the thermal conductivity of an object because of the moist layer, the liquid layer at the surface. And it also involves a change in the, uh, in the surface energy and quite a drastic change because normally when your skin interacts with an object, you have contributions from both the van der Waals force and the capillary force of thin liquid bridges between your fingers and the objects that you're touching. Now, if you introduce moisture, that changes everything, it changes the intermolecular forces it also changes the thermal conductivity. So that's been something we have been, uh, we've been working on and that's particularly challenging. The next question is how difficult is it to replicate the sense of touch, especially in the virtual world? What is the most important aspect to consider? So uh, there are many aspects that the community is working on. Uh, our group tends to focus on near surface properties, so fine texture and materials properties that are associated with soft matter, so those that involve soft, uh, relatively small deformations of the skin, as opposed to the sensation of solid objects, which is more in the kinesthetic and proprioceptive realm. So, uh, so there, are, there are a lot of challenges. Um, not all of them are most amenable to a materials uh, perspective. Uh, for example, kinesthesia and proprioception are probably most well um, uh, addressed using sort of conventional, um, uh, conventional types of, of actuators. Thank you for that question. Okay, next question. I'm wondering what kind of thin film synthesis method can be used to efficiently fabricate biosensor-based hapt uh, haptic biomaterials? Is there any specific synthesis condition to synthesize them? So we've been using a lot of different um, synthetic techniques from synthesis of materials in a flask to microfabrication techniques like soft lithography. Some of the most difficult challenges are, are related to the fact that most microfabrication techniques like photolithography and soft lithography, so stamping and molding and embossing, they work really well for things like silicone rubber, PDMS, and polymethyl methacrylate, but they don't really work well for some of the materials that we've been making in the lab. So if, if the material that you want is say a liquid crystal elastomer that has an embedded say molecular dye absorber. So you want to make a material that contracts when you shine light on it, which could be useful on the, on the micro scale to make uh, haptic surfaces. They're not often uh, compatible with soft lithographic mold molding and embossing and photolithographic techniques. So really merging these types of synthesis methodologies together is what we're finding as one of the most significant challenges. So you, you basically need to design the material not only for the properties that you want once it's cast into a desirable form, but you need to make it so that it's fabricable into that form to begin with. And that's, that's a challenge. Next question, what kind of sensor used to detect touch? How do you incorporate all the sensors? So I think that question came when I was talking about the silicone fake finger rubbing against the surface. In that case, we used a, a commercial uh, uh, load cell in a makeshift um, uh, force 
apparatus. So it's a bit like the load cell you would find in a pull tester, but we put the pull tester on its side and use the most sensitive load cell we could uh, we could buy. So on the the milli newton uh, range. Okay, why are you choosing um, why are you choosing biomaterial as the haptic sensor instead of the inorganic material? Is it cheaper or is it because it's for a sustainable reason? The reason that we're using organic or soft materials for the haptic uh, actuators is that you can do things with soft matter that you can't do with hard materials. Soft materials are easier to reconfigure because they have uh, because they have properties that can be, because they're molecular, they have properties that can be altered using stimuli like light absorption, like electric fields, and so on. And also the mechanical properties are much more amenable to human touch than hard materials. And because you can do a lot with hard materials, right? Most of hap the history of haptics has been using uh, hard types of, of actuators. And so that, uh, Part of the field is quite uh, quite well explored. So, how close is any of this work to being produced commercially? Um, the answer is not uh, not close. <laughs> um, that hasn't really been a priority of this particular uh, research. We do have some other research on graphene production and uh, graphene based. Uh, mechanical biosensors that uh, we have filed patents on and we have a startup who's a startup company that is pursuing that work commercially but as far as haptics goes we've been focused ma mainly on materials development and basic psychophysics okay since the haptic uh, haptics also relies on the brain to process the signals uh, if there are neurological abnormalities, would it change the, the haptic signal received by the brain? Almost certainly, yes. Um, there are a lot of different neurological and um, uh, you know, neurological disorders um, and congenital defects, which would make tactile um, uh, simulation or tactile um, uh, sensing quite difficult. Um, there are some famous cases of people who were born without the gene, the, the key protein for the Pacinian corpuscle, which detects vibration and uh, deep tissue um, pressure in the skin. And those people have to feel their way around the, the world by, uh, by basically pain signals. So really noxious uh, stimuli. There are other types of neurological um, you know, modifications like you know, like lidocaine and, and things like that that alter the sense of touch as well, which have actually been quite useful in understanding how, uh, how the sense of touch works. Um, next question, do you have any future planning related to the usage of nanobiomaterials? So yeah, I think that, that there is a potential use case in uh, haptic art for the blind or even incited individuals. So we have a project with a psychology group that is using um, synesthetes, so individuals who mix senses in their brain. So they touch something and they see a color. We're using those people to see if we can make artwork that, uh, that uses tactile interactions. Haptic materials been applied in our daily devices. So in your, um, not any of the ones that I've talked about, but I think that um, if you have a, a phone that has a haptic, like a button on it, or you press harder and you can feel something shake in there, um, haptic effects are starting to, to find their way into commercial products, but not yet the ones that we've uh, been making. Uh, next question, uh, what is the critical point in choosing the haptic material? So what we're really trying to do is access types of sensations that can't be generated using a commercial device. So mostly those are properties that are like the soft properties, properties associated with biological tissue, um, thermal conductivity, uh, uh, moisture, adhesion, tack, 
um, uh, near surface roughness, hardness, softness, that kind of thing are the ones that are most amenable to new types of uh, materials innovation. So I have gone through all of the chat questions. Um, we're almost out of time. So thank you so much again for your uh, attention and, uh, and thank you again for giving me the opportunity to talk to you.